So thank you everybody uh, for joining us for uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, we'd like to talk about uh, education and how technology is, uh, is changing uh, this field. I think uh, this is an interesting topic for everybody because I think uh, we all have our experiences, whether it was a success or whether it was a small failure uh, in education. And uh, everyone has a passion for it, uh, as probably most of you have somebody in your family uh, going through school or some kind of formal education. Uh, today, you know, we'd like to discuss this uh, ever-changing field of education uh, and how technology is uh, evolving and accelerating uh, its changes. Uh, we have three speakers today, uh, Young Me, Dennis, and June. Uh, they're all from different uh, uh, fields and they have different perspectives. So I'd like to have uh, all three of you uh, give a quick a little talk about uh, your insights on uh, education and how technology is changing uh, this field. Okay, I guess I'll begin. Uh, so as Swimmy said, my name is Young Me Moon and I am Dean of the MBA program at Harvard Business School. But what I really am is I am an educator. I'm a teacher. And I'm someone who thinks a lot about the future of education. Now, I know we're going to be talking a lot about that topic in this panel. So let me begin by simply saying this. When I was a little girl growing up, this is what school looked like. And if I had to be honest with you, I would confess that I actually didn't like school very much. I mean, some of the classes were OK. But for the most part, I found the experience to be rather tedious. Uh, the only reason, in fact, I kept going day after today was because I had to. It was required. So I was forced to go every day to school. This, in fact, is true in so many countries around the world today. School is required. And ironically, I would argue that this simple fact, the fact that school is required, is one of the reasons why education as a category tends to be so slow moving, so resistant to change. I mean, think about it for a second. If you could go back in time and you could take a look at what watching TV used to be like many years ago, or playing games, what it used to be like many years ago, or going to the movies, what it used to be like many years ago, and then you were to fast forward to today and take a look at what the television experience is like today, or what playing video games is like today, or going to the movies is like today. What you would see is that in every single one of these categories, without exception, it's fair to say that the experience has become significantly more engaging, more immersive, more magnetic, more irresistible. However, if you were to go back in time and take a look at what learning used to be like many years ago, and you were then to fast forward today and take a look at what learning looks like now, what you would see is that not much has changed at all. In fact, for so many students around the world today, the experience continues to be very tedious and very uninspiring. And again, I would argue that the reason for this is when it comes to education, the audience is essentially captive, which means that if you're a teacher, you actually have very little incentive to try to even be more engaging. In fact, if you're a teacher like me, one of the first things that you discover very early in your career is that it is remarkably easy to get away with being a very boring teacher because your students are essentially stuck with you no matter what, all right? More specifically, all you really have to be is you have to be kind of an information delivery system, right? You just need to feed your students a lot of information, whether it's through lectures or through textbooks or whatever, and it's their job to absorb it. Now, does the system work? Sort of, I mean, it kind of works, but it's also deeply flawed. And one of the biggest problems with our educational system today is what I call the motivation problem. That is to say, if you are someone who is highly motivated, who really cares about doing well in school and getting good grades, you're gonna be just fine. However, if you are someone who has trouble motivating yourself, you are probably going to be left behind. Now, the reason I say all this is I have spent the last few years really digging into this new world of online learning, all right? This new emergent world 
of online learning. And here's what I can tell you about this world. One of the most remarkable things about most current online learning models today is that they do not require their students to take them. In other words, they're entirely voluntary. Whether you take them or not is completely up to you. Now, that sounds like a great thing, and in fact, it sort of is, but it also means that the audience is no longer captive, which means that students can come and go as they choose, which is exactly what they do. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. One of the most popular online courses offered by MIT, one of the greatest universities in the world, even though it's not Harvard, <laughs> uh, is a course called Electrical Circuits, okay? This is a course that is offered for free to anyone around the world. Last year, 150,000 people around the world signed up to take this course. 150,000, that's an extraordinary number. By the end of the course, guess how many people remained in the course? Fewer than 5%, all right? Now think about this for a second. A course offered by one of the greatest universities in the world, delivered by one of the greatest academic scientists in the world, had more than a 95% dropout rate. And in fact, that number is typical. In most online courses today, the dropout rates are extraordinarily high. And the reason for this becomes quite apparent the minute you look at these online courses. Most of them are essentially the online version of what we have done for decades. Again, they're just simple information delivery systems. They, in fact, many teachers, what they do is they simply put their lectures and their textbooks online. In other words, they actually aren't that innovative at all. And so then the question is, what are we doing here today? What, why are we even talking about this if they aren't that innovative? And the answer is, I've actually only just told you part of the story. The other part of the story is this. While it is true that the majority of online courses delivered online today are not that innovative and they have very, very high dropout rates, a tiny percentage of those courses are somehow managing to defy that trend. A tiny percentage of these courses, the most creative courses, the most innovative courses, are managing to capture and hold the attention of tens of thousands of people around the world today. In other words, these courses, which are the exceptions to the rules today, they are the outliers, they are somehow managing to figure out how to make education not only more accessible, but more engaging and more immersive than it's ever been. In other words, I believe that the real breakthrough in online learning hasn't happened yet, but it's on the verge of happening. It's about to happen. And one of the reasons that's true is for the first time in history online, teachers can no longer get away with being boring. In other words, they're being forced to compete in a marketplace of courses and therefore being forced to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative, to be creative in how they capture their students' imagination. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, young me. Uh, I think we have uh, the right person uh, sitting right beside you uh, to answer some of the uh, questions you asked uh, just now. So, Dennis, please take it from here. Sure, thanks for that perfect segue, by the way. I, I did that for you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Dennis Yang, I am the president of Udemy, and our mission at Udemy is to democratize skills-based education in the lifelong learning market segment. We do this by providing a platform where any expert, in, instructor, practitioner, faculty member, or industry executive can teach an online course in our marketplace that reaches millions of students around the world. So why do we want to do this? We want to do this because we believe that the expiration date or half-life of an individual skill set is decreasing at a rate that's faster than ever before, primarily because of the way technology is disrupting our lives, both professional and personal. As an example of this, you can see that 65% of grade school kids today <coughs> will have jobs that don't even exist. Now, 
Now what's troubling is the fact that our formal academic or education system, frankly, may not be keeping up with the pace of change that's happening in the world around us. So already we see that our youth comprise of roughly 40% of our unemployment. We need to take it upon ourselves to make sure that our youth are getting the right education. And frankly, they may learn in different manners than how we were taught when we were growing up. So at the end of the day, we believe that the most important skill for an individual in the future is actually the ability to learn a new skill. Dennis, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we have uh, Jim Murai, uh, who I, I, we call the father of internet in Japan. Uh, I'd like to see through your crystal ball uh, how technology or how education is evolving uh, here in this country. Oh, yeah, my country? OK, Japan. All right, so um, uh, let's see. Um, you know, let me start with the, you know, how the uh, internet changed the world, right? I mean, the, it's, a, it's a really the, you know, probably the most, uh, you know, the strongest impact of the internet you know, I, I say sometimes before internet and after internet, we are living in the after internet era, right? And uh, then, you know, what's different? Uh, it's, a, you know, kind of globally connected. But, the, but the, we can't forget that uh, there is a nation, uh, you know, still existing, right? International world and the global world, right? Okay, so uh, in that sense, uh, you know, looking at the education, then, you know, I, if you asked me about Japan. So uh, Japan, it's a country, Japan has a different, you know, using the different uh, mother tongue languages, and that then, uh, you know, the education system is uh, uh, largely uh, stepped into by the government, Ministry of Education, right? Okay, so uh, now, then, you know, that's a characteristic of Japan. Um, now, um, the, uh, considering that kind of a global nature of the, the after internet era, then I know. So the question is, uh, with the internet technology and the, what we can do with the uh, education. Um, so I see a lot of uh, things, but uh, then I know probably the, uh, especially the you know living in Asia and the working in a, uh, a lot of Asian countries and the other nations. Then I know probably the uh, the what uh, Yami was talking uh, the, as an online part of uh, education things. Uh, you know uh, the a lot of, uh, uh, before the dropout, but it's, a, it's great that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, best classes in the world are uh, coming from the, you know, leading universities uh, in the United States to the world, in, but uh, provided in English, right? So, uh, uh, Dennis, your business is in English, right? Okay. Basically in, in English, so far. Yes, most of our instructors okay. today right, have, are teaching in English. And uh, then, you know, I think that's still fine. But then, you know, if uh, we see the, all the un unemployment around the world, then you know, a lot of uh, people need uh, their local language and the local care. And, uh, you know, probably uh, that part is uh, uh, the nation's responsibility to, uh, you know, how their uh, country is going to be adjusting to the kind of global space uh, on the education, uh, like uh, what they uh, introduced. So uh, let me... Um, try to show uh, two uh, examples uh, what I'd like to say. So, uh, um, back, forward, forward. This one, okay, thank you. All right, okay, this is a slide. Um, I kind of uh, uh, intentionally uh, deleted the company name. I, I, okay, it's a company limited. Okay, that's the name. But it's a very <laughs> famous uh, internet equipment company. Uh, is offering for the international uh, university collaboration things. And uh, I think uh, that's a very good program. So uh, let me use this as an example. Um, this is uh, basically the university, uh, you know, put into the single full year uh, about the international internship into the, their uh, businesses. So the students learning four years, but undergrad. And then they know one full year is going to be spent in their countries, and that then you know, into, including the other education and the experiences of the uh, jobs, and that then they're coming back. So that this system is uh, giving a kind of uh, uh, you know kind of international experiences to the students, so that uh, you know learning experience. But the, in most importantly, I want to emphasize is that the relationship, future relationship uh, with uh, uh, companies 
and the university's education institute uh, can be a much uh, more, uh, you know, to be connected uh, by the internet. So that's, uh, you know, this type of uh, uh, activity is going to be uh, much easier to achieve. And uh, the second one is uh, what the K University is uh, providing. The, the entire university is uh, having a kind of a network and then a jointly working to have us, this is a big data analysis based uh, approaches on uh, uh, you know, emerging issues in Asia. This is a program, but the, the, this is a, one of the first one that uh, each of the nation's uh, university is gonna work together for the giving a certain certificate that uh, providing the market of the students to the industries in that global manner. So uh, those are the two examples, but I want to uh, you know, have a global things and also the good relationship between the industry and the uh, education institutes. So that's the point. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'd like to uh, kick things off with a question to you, Young Mi. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you see a lot of uh, digital trends happening uh, uh, at Harvard or in the US. What are some of the uh, uh, main trends that are happening that's affecting your organization or your classroom, uh, basically? Well, I think, um, you know, I think as June says, there's, there's sort of the world before the internet and the world after the internet. And I think um, what you're seeing right now is the early stage of everyone discovering what the internet means for education. But these are the early days, and I think we have to re really remember that. So what the early days look like is Every, every teacher out there, I think, is discovering that it is possible to put their course online. And so what you're getting is you're getting a lot of the courses that we've seen historically taught in schools now available online. When I say these are the early days, what I mean by that is this. If, if you look back to the early days of television, what, what they did when they invented television is they took a television camera and they put it in front of a, of a, a theater and the actors would act out a play, and they would broadcast that. And if you were to look at those TV shows today, we would laugh at them because they were they were so they are so almost silly in their execution. I think that's the stage we're almost at when it comes to online learning today. We're putting cameras in front of people. Now, on the one hand, this is fantastic because it, what it means is that any student around the world can potentially take a course from a from, from a. Harvard University professor or an MIT professor or a Tokyo University professor. Um, and so that's fantastic. The, the, I think the, the dirty little secret in education has been that you know, there, a lot of teaching is actually not that good. And so now <laughs> the world sort of is able to see. Are you allowed see, to say that? <laughs> yes, I think you're, you're allowed to say that. And so now you know, the world has access to all of this great stuff. Um, and I think what the world is discovering is that it's actually not as easily digestible as we would hope. And it's only a few outlier teachers on the internet today, I think, that have really begun to crack the code on how to make information and content exciting and accessible online. I see. June, uh, you know, you spoke on your slide that, that you're trying to set up a network of universities, uh, right. mainly in Asia. What, what would be some of the obstacles or hurdles that you need to clear uh, like what Young Mi mentioned uh, to get uh, your project uh, started and moving forward. Well, actually, the uh, you know not related to my project necessarily, but uh, I, I'm interested in you know, what the Young Mi said. And uh, then you know, so uh, we we all know about uh, you know things like uh, MOOCs, right? Uh, these days, and everybody, especially in the Japan, you know, Japanese version of the MOOC, it's uh, just about to start. Um, so the yeah, as uh, Young Mi said, it's uh, you know kind of. Uh, uh, very, very uh, great classes in the world, and then I distributed to uh, everybody. But the probably what we we shouldn't forget is that uh, you know when we are you know the the another characteristic of the internet is a kind of personalization, right? So that uh, you know diversity of the teachers can be uh, you know connected with uh, students in a, uh, no matter where uh, you know the teacher is going to be located or students going to be located that's a very important point so the matching you know now the matching mechanism is uh, through the brand name Harvard University right and then they're going to that classes but if there is a way that uh, you know kind of a sophisticated way of a matching on the internet like other services on the internet 
you know, probably that's going to be a much more uh, good opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of mix together with the teachers and the, you know, learners uh, in a, a various ways. So uh, that's uh, probably the, you know, I, I'd like to uh, implement that on a kind of by university network system. I see. Uh, two key words I think I picked up, for, uh, Dennis, was one is competition on teachers and the word MOOCs. I think uh, a lot of uh, the people in the audience uh, today aren't quite familiar with the, uh, the word MOOCs. Uh, if you can touch upon a little bit about what's happening in the U.S. with MOOCs and then maybe uh, take it to the next step in terms of education outside the classroom uh, on lifelong learning, that would be great. Sure. So I'll first by uh, defining a MOOC in case folks here um, don't know what that is. What it's, it, it's, the, it's an acronym, four letters, M-O-O-C, and it stands for Massive open online course, and it was originally originated outside of, uh, w within the walls of academic institutions where, you know, whether it's Stanford, Harvard, MIT, they would put some of their most popular courses online, and I think the seminal course uh, was Stanford's Artificial Intelligence for Robotics, and when they first put that course online, they ended up having approximately 160,000 students enroll into this particular class, so when you think about that, Think about how long it would take an individual professor to be able to reach that many people and teach that many students and how many years that would take. It literally would probably take a couple centuries. So um, that's obviously been an incredible phenomena, both in the press and uh, as well as student interest. Uh, students around the world, and when I say students, I just mean individuals, broadly speaking. They've had uh, a lot of interest in enrolling in these courses, not necessarily finishing them, uh, as Young Min had mentioned a little bit earlier. but. Uh, investigating to see what would actually feels like to actually take one of these courses. So, um, you know, from our perspective, we at Udemy, uh, our belief is that there are great teachers outside of just the walls of uh, elite academic institutions. So, if you, if everybody here thinks about their own personal lives and their own per personal history and they think about teaching that happens within the school system, within the a formal academic system, but also outside of that, whether it's a boss or a mentor or even a coach in sort of a, you know, a sporting setting, if you will, you've learned from great teachers and people throughout your lives. So from our perspective, what we're trying to do is uncover those people and allow them and give them a platform to teach students around the world. So. What I would encourage folks in the audience to think about is not necessarily be an individual or, or student, I should say individual or consumer of a MOOC. I think everybody here probably mostly identifies them with themselves as a student of one of these classes, but rather think of yourself as a potential producer. What's something that you are an expert in that you could share your knowledge with either with students all through Japan or through the rest of the world? Because in lifelong learning, which is where we f focus on, whether it's skills-based education for professional purposes or personal enrichment or casual interest, that world is changing faster than ever before. That informal lifelong learning segment is changing and the demand there is growing faster than uh, all the other segments. So um, we think the complexity and the diversity involved there does require uh, the support of the entire community. Can I pick up on something that, sure. um, that Dennis said that I think is so interesting? I think. Um, you know, if, if you think about all, the one thing that we all have in common in this room is we've all gone to school and we've all had many, many teachers. And I, I think we've probably all had a similar experience in, in, in the sense that we've had, we've, most of the teachers that we had were sort of average. We had a, maybe a few that were extraordinary. And then we had a few on the other side of the bell curve that, you know, that we don't talk about very much. <laughs> But, but there's sort of a bell curve distribution of students. So there's, there's two things that are happening uh, with MOOCs and, and with online courses. The first is what Dennis alluded to. What, what online technology allows us to do is to take those outliers, those extraordinary teachers, and give them a platform unlike any platform they've had before. So they've taken what we have always thought of as being excellence in teaching, and they have, um, they have created a platform to make that louder, uh, more accessible than ever. But the second thing that I think that's happening that's equally exciting is that online learning is not just changing what excellence looks like on this high end, but it also has the capacity to change what average looks like. In other words, some of the tools that are available online that we haven't fully untapped yet, personalization is one that June referred to, 
interactivity. There's so many elements of interactive learning that allow, that if we were to use at their full potential, would allow us to really not only change what the high end of the distribution looks like, but change what the middle of the distribution looks like. So that what is, is our typical experience ends up being significantly better than it was. Just like an average movie going experience today is significantly better than it was 20 or 30 years ago, that's, that's the direction in which education should be moving. And that's what I think is very exciting. If I could just add on to that. So as an example within our marketplace, um, if you want to teach a particular topic, as an instructor, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to check out the existing instructors or teachers who are already teaching that particular topic. So before you do anything, the first thing you, you do is check out the competition. You say, oh, I can see on Udemy as an example, somebody teaching for this particular course, let's call it you know, Microsoft Excel as an example, they've got 50,000 students and it costs roughly $99 for, to enroll in that particular course. There's a lot of interest for learning about this particular topic. What is so great about this teacher in this course? And what do I need to beat in order for me to be successful? Because if I can't do that, I'm probably not going to try. That, that, that's a yeah, very interesting part that, that you know, the, any kind of, uh, you know, the topics. I mean, so the university class and school class tend to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, you know, kind of existing curriculum, as uh, Yami uh, first uh, slide says, that, uh, you know, it's kind of existing uh, classes and the studies and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, not very much different for years, right? But then, uh, you know, what you have said, uh, Dennis, is that, uh, you know, you can propose, uh, you know, this as a, I mean, I'm going to be a teacher on this, and then, then you can open up the classes uh, anywhere. But uh, yeah, one of the things that you might not be a, a known for things. You, you know, in a company Yamaha, do you play music instruments? Okay, good. And uh, then you know, a, a lot of people in this country, uh, you know, in the kids, are very much uh, you know, kind of attending the Yamaha Music School to learn play, how to play piano and uh, you know, other musical instruments. And then they know, and the, all the people, well, adult people, like like them, you know, they are very busy, and they they always you know been thinking about someday I'm gonna play rock and roll guitar, right? Okay. Then they, when they get retired, then they know, now they are providing the interactive music uh, education uh, over the internet now. So we're connecting the music instrument, so the you know play, uh, connecting with the MIDI signals so that uh, they can teach. Teaching can play the music instruments on uh, your own, connecting to the internet. And the interactively, sometimes, uh, they, can, they can teach. And their business is now uh, extending beyond the country now, so uh, to, to the Asia and the other countries. So those are the technology in the network, in the interactive education, and the newly created uh, education provided by the, probably if you have a, a more than average of a musical instrument uh, teaching uh, ability, then uh, you can join that kind of a platform. So uh, that's going to be a, a new way. You know, just to get a, a better idea, Dennis, right, of, you know, I think June touched upon a, a diff, uh, an interesting point. I think when everyone hears about education, they think about history or chemistry, ooh, you know. Um, what are some of the courses that are really popular? I think, yeah, I mean, you touched upon, uh, you know, some of these very small number but extremely popular courses on your platform right now. Yeah, so today the, um, the most popular courses fall into what we call professional development or skill development. Practical skills that you could say, I should have learned in school, but I didn't, and I actually need them for my job. That's probably the biggest category, whether it's technology, design, business. So mainstream topics such as learning Microsoft Excel, web development from scratch, iOS app development, design, those types of things. So, and also soft skills as well, negotiations, uh, how to, how to um, in, improve your writing as an example. Um, but to be fair, while that's the biggest category and the most popular to date, I also think that's just a reflection of where we are in the overall market maturation. So as an example, um, that's the biggest segment. The second bi biggest segment is what we call personal enrichment or casual interest. So whether that's music, arts and crafts, hobbies, health and wellness, physical fitness, um, those types of things. That's a fast growing segment and I think it's going to change and it's going to rotate as the market 
develops. So it makes sense in a lot of ways that technology is the most popular today because that's the tip of the spear. That's sort of the early adopters. But I expect as this continues to grow, I think we're very much in the very beginning of this. Uh, you're going to see all sorts of categories that you would never have expected. So, um, you know, on our on our platform, as an example, we have both of these broad-based topics, as I, I mentioned, but we also have very new and uh, niche topics I, I would have, frankly, never expected. So, as an example, just a couple weeks ago, a new course that came onto our platform is um, how to pass the written exam to become a firefighter. And over a year ago, well before it was popular, somebody put up a course on uh, teaching Bitcoin. Back, Bitcoin. Back then, I thought Bitcoin was just a fad. And I thought it was going to go away. And I never took it. But now I, I really have to take it at this particular point. Although they're still working out the kinks. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Great. Thank you. I mean, listening to uh, the three of you uh, the talk, you know, we have this great evolution and acceleration in, uh, in education. And uh, when I think about it, going back to the classroom, if I was a teacher, I'm going to feel like this technology thing is going to be a big threat to my profession. Yeah, me, what do you think no, about that? No, 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 not at all. I don't think so at all. I think um, as long as the world need people to learn, the world will need people to teach. Now, I think what's true in, in education, as it's true in every industry, is if you don't, if you don't, if you don't stay awake, the future is going to slap you in the face. And I think that's that's a healthy thing, quite honestly. But I think the opportunity um, is in so many places with respect to technology. So, if if you think about the reasons why people disengage from learning, and the reasons why school becomes boring or uninteresting. One of the reasons is there are th three reasons I can think of. The first reason is you get frustrated. You're trying to learn something you can't. It's hard. It's very frustrating. And the way that teachers have uh, have addressed that in the past is they just they just sort of expect you to learn and they bang you over the head with it. I think re recently I have two uh, confession. I have two sons and they are a little bit of addicted to video games right now. I'm sure people in the audience can sympathize. <laughs> It's fascinating to watch them play these games online because what's interesting is whenever you get in trouble in the game, the game starts to talk to you and tell you what to do. It's fascinating to watch. So there's always a map in the corner telling you where you're supposed to go. And if you start to wander off, something will pop up on the screen. It will redirect you. And all of this happens without any frustration on the part of the user. There is an opportunity when it comes to technology and teaching to, to create an experience in, when, in, in which you're constantly giving reinforcement. Technology can be the most patient teacher. The second area, the second reason you get really disengaged is when the pacing is off. When you're trying to learn something and the teacher is going too slow or too fast and the pacing's off and so you disengage. There too, you can imagine a much more personalized learning experience in which the pacing is adjusted exactly the way that you want it. And then the third reason that I think we get disengaged is that the content just doesn't come to life for us. And so as we're absorbing the content, we tend to, to just frankly get bored. And I think there too, with technology, there is an opportunity to bring the lessons that, that you're trying to teach to life in a way that is really difficult to do in a classroom environment. Just like June was talking about with the music example and, and using the instruments, I think that's an example of bringing things. So in all of these dimensions, I think um, if teachers are only, if, if they're only willing to embrace technology, there is a, a real opportunity for them to have lifelong tenure as well as lifelong learning. June, as an educator yourself, uh, if you have anything to add on to, you know, what would you give, kind of advice would you give to teachers uh, as we go forward with uh, more technology coming into the classroom? Well, actually the, the you know, it uh, depends on, uh, uh, you know, the, the place like, uh, you know, what Dennis is uh, providing, the marketplace and the new marketplace so that uh, you can propose, uh, you know, uh, your way of uh, uh, teaching things and uh, for the uh, connecting with, uh, you know, th new learners and that then they're matching and, uh, you know, dynamically moving up. Uh, forward, you know, that's what the, uh, the place can do. And the, uh, on the other hand, then the other schools and the university, existing universities, got the, probably the certain level of the law. As I mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, you know, kind of each of the nations got its uh, role on the education, and that then you know, that part is uh, uh, still there. 
And uh, but the important thing is that uh, yeah, as you mentioned, then uh, we can we can connect that space with the new space, right? Okay, that's a, a very much of a, a new way of uh, doing that. So that the uh, excitement be, uh, coming into the existing uh, school class, university class, and also be helped and uh, get a less boring place. I mean, uh, for the you know to for school to be. Um, one of the example I, I'm I'm now trying uh, you know my my Japan MOOC class starting from uh, May you know it's a course called the Internet okay so uh, because that's a kind of existing uh, uh, talk about the introduction of the Internet therefore I decided my real class in the university called the Internet the same title in the I decided not to talk about those things anymore in the class. Then I you know, instead, uh, get, get, talk to my students that, uh, that happened yesterday, by the way. Uh, talk to my students that uh, go to the MOOC, and then you know, uh, listen to my uh, series of uh, classes, and uh, now I'm gonna talk uh, different things in this class. Uh, probably, uh, you know, it's uh, just the beginning. Uh, I'm, I'm starting yesterday. so. Uh, then you know, probably the, the class turned out to be more exciting, and then you know, if they want to learn about how internet is working, they're gonna go to the online school. But you know, instead, then probably we can, I can use the classroom, more exciting things in an interactive way, so that the, probably the same class, but that's uh, uh, drastically being changed. Just for everyone to get a, a better visual on what your classroom will look like after they study, you know, the actual what you do uh, on on the MOOCs platform. What kind of uh, uh, class are you going to operate? Uh, is it more going to be a workshop style, or is it going to be more of a Q and A? What, what what do you envision? Well, yeah, for my particular class, then you know, it's a, it's a always good at the university class that they're learning from the students. I mean. So uh, especially on the technology and the, then you know, the things like the internet, it's a really you know kind of but changing all the time, and then it's really important to uh, learn from students. But you know, professors should learn from students, right? Okay, so uh, you know that part's going to be in the class uh, coexisting when we are connecting with the online version of the class. Then uh, we can do that. So uh, then it's coming more for the uh, from the platform side. Uh, you know, obviously, I think uh, MOOCs has been for the last maybe one or two years very popular in the U.S. Uh, and seems like it's growing. Uh, looking at it from Japan, what are some of the actual hurdles or obstacles that you're facing today uh, in order to bring this more global or even expanded uh, across uh, uh, different areas? Sure. So um, there are a couple challenges. The first challenge, um, which Junior you mentioned a little bit earlier, from our perspective. We ultimately want as many instructors out there as possible to teach on Udemy about as much diversity in different types of courses as possible. So ultimately, in every particular country, we want instructors from that particular country to be teaching about skills, whether it's for jobs or for personal development, that matter to students in that particular country. Because we think ultimately you're going to learn better from somebody that looks like you, talks like you, has the same cultural cues. Uh, and teaching things that are relevant for you, not necessarily just from courses or instructors from the U.S. Uh, around uh, topics that come from only academia. There's no question that those have value, but um, there's also so much to learn outside of that uh, that are specific to your particular region. So I think that's one particular challenge for us where we're always looking to expand uh, and um, encourage as many instructors to teach as possible. And then the second piece is uh, you know, something Young Me had uh, mentioned earlier, which is around the engagement. So I, we definitely agree that there are so many interesting things that if you study the gaming industry around how they hook people <laughs> into their games at just the right time with the right motivation and with the right signaling. So how do we incorporate some of those same mechanics into the education market? So it's a combination of both having from the teacher side, teaching the right things from the right people but then also on the student side, how do we make that delivery and engagement as powerful as possible? Dennis, do you find that your, your best online teachers tend to be professional teachers or just folks who are passionate about what they're doing and decide they're gonna put a course online? 
It's actually mostly the latter. Is that right? Yeah, you, you'd be surprised that um, they're not what you would call traditional teachers, like f from traditional academic settings. Maybe, maybe that's what makes them so successful. It's possible. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, another uh, I think qu uh, problem we face, especially in uh, in the modern part of the world, is a financial disparity in household income in education. Um, technology has a, an opportunity to change that. Uh, anyone can take classes at Harvard um, or some of the courses that are online at Harvard. Um, June, uh, as someone coming uh, from the internet background as well as education, um, how do you think uh, we can overcome uh, financial disparity, and probably in the future, disparity on how much internet connection we have or some of the devices we have. Uh, is there any possibility of uh, this changing or more disparity coming from uh, you know, education uh, coming through technology? Well, I, th I think it's a, a very much, a, you know, I feel optimistic about the kind of a business model and the, you know, the economics uh, around the education as well. So, uh, you know, I you know, learn from a Dennis and then they, I can immediately uh, thinking about the, you know, various way of uh, doing the uh, kind of a local culture based uh, uh, way of uh, learning and education immediately, right? Because there is a requirement there and that then, you know, there is a, uh, you know, if there is a proper marketplace on the internet, like, like what he's creating, then, you know, uh, it's a, a very much a kind of, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's a, you know, when the scale is a bigger, then you know, cost is a lower, drastically. Basically, that's the internet. Okay, so uh, that's the benefit of the internet. So uh, that's uh, that's one. And uh, also the, you know, uh, the as a slice of uh, uh, yummy, then you know, it's a kind of a global way, and uh, then the you know, global uh, internet popula uh, population is uh, growing. Right? You know, probably starting from a uh, thirty-seven percent to uh, ninety percent in uh, coming ten years. Okay. Then you know coverage, the rapid recovering covering area is uh, they really need the education, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it's a, when we think about the global market, then uh, it's uh, also uh, you know in that part uh, you know very much of uh, the, the government uh, uh, responsibility sometimes, but uh, then uh, you know very low cost and uh, then providing the good education for the proper way and the proper. Uh, uh, you know the people who need the education. Okay, that system can be uh, created in a, uh, only after the internet. Right. So, but that's that's very much optimistic. Great. Uh, I think I'd like to take some questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, if anyone has any questions, if you can raise your hand. Hey, please. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, your thoughts uh, from a professional perspective. I really enjoyed that, and it was very insightful. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very much interested in um, um, your personal experience. I mean, how you educate your kids at home, because I'm a father of two kids. <laughs> Sometimes it is different. Uh, in reality, I mean, at school and at home. So, um, if you if you could please share your um, personal experience your, or your principles at home, or any mistakes or failures uh, in the past. Young me, I, I read your book, and uh, <laughs> some of the first uh, few pages uh, talk about uh, your your are. sons. Okay, um, I think that's a really interesting and unexpected question. Um, <laughs> Although it's it's interesting because I do I do think that there's sort of a little bit of a, a parallel with what we're talking about here. So I appreciate the question very much. I think one of the things that I have learned about being a parent is that there there are really two two ways that you can try to motivate your children to do something. One of the ways is you can just force them to try to do it. You can just you know you you've, you got to you can just tell them yeah they have to do it and because you're the boss they have to do it. Um, <laughs> But a second way to do it is, is to not always try to require them to do things, but to try to inspire them, to try to, try to get them to motivate themselves and try to instill that kind of, um, of self-motivation, that kind of self 
self-correction that they need to make decisions on their own. And I think that's one of the, the hardest things as a parent to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, I, so some of the things that I've learned along the way, and by the way, I've made many, many mistakes, and if my children were here, they would be able to tell you every single one of those <laughs> mistakes. Um, but I think one of the things that I have learned is that when, whenever, you, um, whenever you are trying to get your, your kids to do something that they don't want to do, it's really important for them to know where it's coming from. And if they know that it's coming from a good place, if they know that it's coming from nothing but love and concern for them, then that is the single most important thing you can do. If it ever gets to the point where you're having an argument with your kids and it starts to feel competitive or it starts to be about you and about them, then you're, you're just in a really, really bad place. Interestingly, to tie this back to education, I think the same is true as a teacher. I found the same is true with respect to my students. Whenever, you know, I can either try to require them to do something or I can inspire them to do something. And whenever I if, if figure out the, the latter, it's always significantly more powerful. So that's my parenting tip for the day. Is that okay? How was that? That was unexpected. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, second question. Uh, we'll get it from the gentleman in the pink shirt in front. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is, uh, how do you envision the uh, future of uh, education system? I mean, uh, we know that um, online courses are very um, new, but it, and it needs a lot of uh, changes in the next 20 years, 20, 30 years. But will it eventually replace like mathematics for five-year-olds, but or just universities, or um, how do you see that uh, aspect on the education? June, system? Uh, would you like to take that question? Well, uh, yes. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, not, well, online courses is a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, a dump of the existing, uh, you know, university classes online. Uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, it's a how it started. But, the, you know, there could be, you know, the, the classes are very much interactive. And so the, one of the issues is how that uh, interaction between the, and the among among the students and the, between the teacher and the students, you know, how that interaction is going to be uh, uh, implemented on the you know, online education things, which is uh, happening in uh, many ways, including that uh, Yamaha experiences. But uh, you know, that's going to be happening. And the, also, the uh, online education system combining with the existing uh, university and the classroom experiences type of uh, educations are uh, going to be, uh, you know, it's a kind of a hybrid way of uh, uh, working together. That's also happening, but it's uh, uh, just the beginning, and then it's going to be uh, uh, opening up a great f uh, future of the education system. And also, uh, the last three, the, uh, you know, education institutes like universities and schools working with uh, uh, the other entities, other stakeholders about education including the uh, industry, companies, business, and also the parents, homes, you know, uh, diversity of, uh, uh, you know, variety of uh, uh, teachers can be, uh, well, not only teachers, I mean, variety of uh, stakeholders can be involved in the education uh, in uh, many ways, university level, school level, and uh, that uh, was not very easy before internet, but uh, after internet, uh, that can be possible. So uh, the, you know, a lot of uh, uh, new things happening. I believe uh, you know a lot of futures uh, and the opportunities and the challenges in front of us. So those of you who like to ask questions in Japanese, please feel free to do so. Uh, especially those uh, ventures who are related to education. Uh, Dennis, I think, will also like to answer your question. So please feel free. Hi. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, hello, I'm Arnold Jensen. Uh, I run a company uh, that is doing online language learning. Uh, we do both Japanese and English. Uh, we're customizing uh, the experience to the users using artificial intelligence. Now, the, one of the uh, challenges that we are facing 
is uh, when we are uh, well, mostly B2C, but when we are going B2B to the universities, for example, where they're teaching English and Japanese, um, the teachers often come up with the question, so are you replacing my job? <laughs> what, what are your takes on that? I would love to know how you respond to that question. <laughs> um, I think that I think that you know this, and this speaks to, to your to your question how how education is going to change. I think that if if um, I think teachers need to accept the fact that in the future the things that they do as teachers is going to be fundamentally different than the things that they do today. There are things that teachers do today that, quite frankly, students are so much better off learning from a piece of technology or learning offline. In the same way that June described having his students. Uh, listen to his lectures at home the night before so that they could do different things in the classroom. I think that is true today. I think what's scary for teachers today is that they don't know what else to do. They don't know what to do if they're not the content delivery mechanism. So I think that's one, uh, one thing that's going to be true. But I also, th the second thing that I think is true is that, that we need to accept the fact that the way that students learn today is fundamentally different than the way we learn as children, if I look at my kids today and the way they process information, it is so different than the way that we process information. And quite frankly, the things that we have a natural bias against as adults, um, whenever we see technology intrude in that, in that teaching relationship, I think young people today don't have that same bias. And so they are much more amenable to using technology um, to learn certain things. And so I think the biggest, the, the most difficult transition for us in the educational system, both on the teaching side as well on the student side, is, is for us to relinquish the things to technology that technology does better and then figure out how can we then step in to fill the gaps that technology can't, can't necessarily do. I also, I also uh, you know, the language uh, te teaching uh, on the online, and uh, is a, uh, you know, the you know it's uh, like I uh, you know, I come to Yamaha too often. I'm sorry, but the you know the interactive education, right? Then then you need a you know a person to person, face to face uh, interactive education for very likely for the language, right? And the, then then you well, so the two things. One thing is uh, you know the same question like uh, you know when the internet is uh, providing the new set of uh, services, what you know, what is the future of my job? That's, that's repeatedly said in uh, many ways. So uh, it's always a competition in the new form of a uh, new way of uh, doing the, that kind of a job. So uh, that's, that's a first uh, answer uh, to your question. But the second answer to your question is, uh, you know, what the Yamaha Music uh, uh, teaching is uh, happening is uh, that because it's uh, interactive, so it's person to person, and uh, then they know. So increasing requirements about the t good teachers so uh, there would be a kind of job opportunities for good teachers increase. So uh, um, that's another way of viewing the future of the language uh, education. Yeah, so I'd like to add to that. Um, I think I would agree with everything that's been said here, but also I think it's more when you work with the teachers and the schools, it's more along the lines of thinking around how can your product or service help the actual teachers? Because if you look, think about the traditional learning hierarchy, at the bottom of it is textbooks, and then in the middle you've got the content delivery, and then at the top you have the actual, actual learning narrative, the most important valuable piece, right? So in a lot of ways, what online courses can do, as an example, or an online platform, um, it takes away the bottom two rungs in the sense that it allows a teacher to actually focus on the most important piece, which is the, the top end of that, that triangle, if you will. So it's not really the bottom two pieces. There's no reason for somebody to recreate the wheel and go back and just take the notes from your notebook, put them on the, the board, have the students write it down without necessarily passing it through the student's brain in between. Can I follow up a little bit on this? Uh, so many of these teachers, they are, uh, you know, they have been teaching the way they've been doing, like for 20 years, and now we got a great tool, you know, to 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 learn better. But they are still like, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm just not an innovative enough to do this, and you know, 
the, the job that I have to do is really, you know, teach them how they can use this tool, right? And that is really, really, really difficult to do with teachers. Go ahead. Well, well, <laughs> I, I, well, frankly, I don't think so. But li li I, I would like to let you know that uh, as a dean, K University, I just hired the additional language teacher uh, who I, I want them to do the uh, language teaching things online. So uh, that's a new skill, challenges. But uh, that, that's what, how I, I'm recruiting the new faculties now. No, I, I think, think what you're talking I, about, I think, you know, structurally and you know, it's more of a government issue at this point. I think we're still in the early stages of, you know, transitioning or implementing online education into the traditional, I think, classroom. I think, you know, this is a, ne a never ending, uh, you know, question. So, you know, I'm gonna uh, cut it here. But, you know, I think, you know, you, you, have, you have a very, you know, important point. You know, I think students need to change, but also the teaching, need, uh, teaching side needs to change. And, I think we're all here to solve that question. Uh, I think we're all interested in uh, making education better. Uh, I think this is a 100% vote, I think. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to uh, end this session by asking each one of you, uh, each one of you, uh, if you have any comments on this interesting field or ever-changing field of ed tech or even ed education as a whole and how we're changing. So. Young me, if you want to take it from here. Sure, I'll, I I think I'll close by um, picking up on a, a thread that Dennis that Dennis presented, which is, you know, we live in a world today where anybody can be a student about anything, but the converse is also true. Anybody can be a teacher about anything. The only way this is going to get better is if we have lots and lots of students and lots and lots of teachers experimenting with education, and what exists today that's never existed in the history of the world is a platform by which people can do that. Every single one of you in this room today can go online tomorrow and teach something, and you can experiment and so on. If there are thousands and thousands of experiments like that running, um, that's what's gonna move the market forward. Dennis? So um, I'll close by saying, I where we are today with education and technology is the very, very beginning. In some ways, the education industry or in the market um, has been immune to technology disruption, but it's finally happening. And um, I'm personally very excited because I think there's a huge future ahead of us in terms of innovation in this particular area, and we're just getting started. Jen? Okay, um, when we are, uh, you know, Thinking about the you know uh, online courses to be shared with a million of people t type of uh, situation, then you know we tend to be uh, start worrying about the you know uh, is this uh, you know everybody's gonna learn in the same ways, same classes, same things, and uh, but it's uh, really the education is uh, you know learning experience is uh, 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 very creative activities, and uh, then you know diversity of uh, uh, contents, diversity of our teachers, and uh, then you know that's going to be the uh, probably the target of the global education uh, space on the internet, right? So uh, that's opportunities, that's a possibility. So uh, I think a global diversity is going to be a, a, a very important thing. So uh, uh, that I think it's exciting. Thank you very much. You know, I like to uh, wrap things up here. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, I was listening to Larry Ellison talk about uh, entrepreneurship at the end of his, uh, his session, that uh, you need to be crazy, right? And, um, but I think and I hope that everyone can take home something today, that every single one of you can be an entrepreneur in this education space. It's still a new space. Hey, you should go to, all go on to Udemy and uh, set up a course. I um, mean, yeah, I think we all have something to add. I think we all have some kind of passion and motivation for education and uh, what it means to all of us and especially for the future. So let's all be crazy. Let's go on Udemy and let's all set up a course and let's make the education uh, world better uh, together with technology. Thank you today. <laughs>